Heavenly Father, we, we come before you. We remember, Father, those who have, uh, you've gathered to yourself in the storm of war. And Lord, we thank you that there is peace to be found only in you, only in knowing your Son as our Saviour. And Lord, may that same peace calm our fears, bring justice to, to all peoples, and Father, establish harmonies among nations. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to stand, if you're able, and sing our first hymn this morning, And Can It Be? Let's sing together.
week. Um, I'm going to take a, a jump forward a, a chapter this morning, because um, really to, to think and, and focus perhaps on, or because of Remembrance uh, Sunday. Um, so I'm going to jump forward to John chapter 15, and I'm going to read just verses 9 to 17. So it's only a little bit forward. Um, we will come back and carry on, um, probably not for many weeks, maybe just one. Um, in December, we're um, planning uh, planning on um, preaching a series in the build up to Christmas. So a Christmas preaching series. I'm never quite sure of the term, but you get the idea. Um, but so this morning, John chapter 15, start reading at verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask in the, the, ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. Amen. Let's continue to worship God in prayer, shall we? Let's turn to him in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this day. We thank you, yes, Father, for, the, for remembrance and remembering all those who have sacrificed so much that we are able to meet together in freedom um, and the blessing that is to us. And Father, we do remember the the conflicts around this world. We think of the wars that are going on. We think of Ukraine. We think of what's happening in, in the Middle East. Uh, Lord, and there's so many other places too that are experiencing conflict. And Father, we realise that the only true peace is to be found in you. So we pray, Lord, that those who are in the midst of the worn, torn land and areas will come to know the Lord Jesus as their Saviour and that they will not come to know true peace in their souls in a relationship with him. And Lord, we pray that on the, on the back of that, there will be peace in between nations too, peace within families, peace between different peoples and tribes and nations. Lord, that is only to be found in you. But Lord, as we remember this morning, we are reminded of your son. We remember the Lord Jesus this morning and of his sacrifice. Lord, we thank you that he took our punishment upon himself for the sins that we've committed. Lord, that your wrath that was rightly on us because of our sin, you placed on your son. And Father, we thank you this morning that as we come before your throne, we are, we are found as innocent in your sight because of the righteousness of the Lord Jesus. That we are found as though we have not sinned not because of any good in us, but because of your Son. Lord, we thank you for the, the tremendous blessing that is. And Lord, because of that, we thank you that you have given us your Holy Spirit to dwell in our hearts, to help us, to help us live lives glorifying to you, to help us to understand the Bible. Thank you that he is that guarantee, that seal upon our souls, that one day we will be with you forever. And we thank you for the great blessing that is. And Lord, we pray this morning for those who can't be with us, for those who are unwell, for those who are away. And we name them in our hearts before you. We commit them to you. 
pray, Lord, that you will be with them and draw close to them. Father, we pray, pray too for our loved ones who don't know you. And again, Lord, we pray that in your mercy that you will reach out and you will touch them and draw them to yourself. Lord, we pray that for our neighbours, for our colleagues, for our village where we live. Oh, Lord, we pray that you will once again move in our land and bring glory to your name. So we pray, Father, this morning. Meet with us through your spirit, we ask, so that we will be true worshippers and people who glorify your name, we ask. Amen. Before we come to the, the sermon, we're going to stand and sing uh, our next hymn, When Peace Like a River. Let's stand and sing together.
was thinking I have to preach after that. <laughs> it's an amazing hymn, isn't it? Uh, that really speaks to us. I think today, of, I suppose, of, of all days, is probably more in our, our collective consciousness, maybe, um, just how many um, war memorials there are everywhere. And even this morning, I had to plan my route here because I know certain roads were closed or because of certain services and marches, um, parades perhaps is a better word, um, where people meet and then they walk towards the memorial and they lay wreaths of poppies and remember. And it doesn't, seems, it doesn't seem to matter where you go in the country, whether that's the smallest village or a town or even a city, usually there will be some type, some kind of war memorial. Apart from, and I think they are called thankful villages or blessed villages. I don't know if you come across those. So those are places in the UK, I think only in England and Wales, I don't think there were any in Scotland or elsewhere, um, where no one was lost in the Great War. So they haven't got a war memorial because they didn't have anyone lost. There are certain places that are called doubly blessed because they didn't lose anyone in the First World War or even the Second World War. I'm not sure there's that many around. But such towns and villages exist, and I don't think they have a memorial service today. They have a Thanksgiving service today, but still to remember. And, and these memorials otherwise, they're, they're pretty much everywhere, wherever you go. They're not always obvious, but often they are. And you can go up and down the country, and they help us, if you like, to remember the cost of war. And for us not to take for granted the freedoms that we enjoy today, all these decades later. As I said earlier, we are able to meet together freely. There are lots of places in this world who would love to enjoy the freedoms that we have. So remembering is important. In the Old Testament, uh, when, when the people of Israel crossed the, the River Jordan into the Promised Land, God instructed Joshua to, to choose 12 men and for them remember to one from each tribe and to take a, a stone, I don't think it was a pebble, it probably quite a large rock, from the middle of the Jordan River that was now dry where they were crossing, and to take them across and to set up, if you like, a, basically a memorial, a sign. And, and if you read Joshua chapter 4, 6, and 7, this is what it says. And the reason, it tells you the reason why they did this. So it says, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So you get the scene. On this night, the river parted and Joshua, as commanded by God, led the people across. They picked up the stones. They created a memorial and the reason, so when you were walking past it with your children and they was like, Dad, what's that mean? What's the purpose? Why are those stones there? We get it today, don't we? We get, you know, Stonehenge. What do they mean? Well, slightly different, I suppose. What do these stones mean? And it gave the father, the mother, the adult, whoever it was, the opportunity to remind them or perhaps tell them for the first time what God had done in saving them, what God had done in giving them the promised land, that he had delivered them from slavery in, in Egypt and how he brought them into freedom into the promised land. A memorial. At the heart of the Christian faith stands an even greater, even more powerful symbol of God's love for us. And that's the cross. In our, in our reading from John's Gospel this morning, Jesus said in verse 4, 13, Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friend. That's what Jesus did for us. 
That's exactly what he did for us. Now, the big difference is, I suppose, that when he laid down his life for us, we weren't his friends. We were far from his friends. We were his enemies, and he still laid down his life for us. The Apostle John writing later on in the letters, 1 John 4, verse 10, he wrote this. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. The Apostle Paul goes on to write in Romans 5 verse 8, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were enemies of God, while we were in rebellion against God, while we wanted nothing to do with God, God showed his love towards us in that Christ died for us. That's love. That's true sacrifice. Through the Lord Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection, Jesus has, has led us, if you like, from, from slavery to sin to freedom in Christ, from, from darkness to light, from, from despair to real hope. From, from alienation with God to reconciliation with God. From, from death to life. The hymn that I've, the song that I've picked uh, for the last one. And uh, they have these words. And it really, when I was preparing, they, 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 they jumped out at me, I suppose. And it's this. My Lord, what love is this that pays so dearly that I, the guilty one, may go free? Amazing love. Oh, what sacrifice. The Son of God given for me. My debt is paid and my death he died that I may live, that I may live, that I might live. And I suppose it begs the question, how, how do you respond to that? How do you respond to, to the Lord Jesus and his sacrificial death for us? How do we respond to such love like that? Well, John here writing in, in chapter 15 says, first of all, we need to remain in God's love. Verse 9 says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you, now remain in my love. That's what Jesus says. As his disciples, as his followers, as Christians, remain in his love. But what does that mean, remain in his love? Well, first of all, it's about knowing and loving God. When Jesus asked, um, what is the greatest commandment of all? Or when he was asked, he answered this in Luke 10, 27. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. But you can't love someone that you don't know. So knowing God should be our first priority. And the way we get to know God or to get to know someone is by spending time in their company. I was going to say, it seems like a very long time ago now, and it probably was. When we were students, I met Ali, my wife, at, at Plymouth in those days. Plymouth Polytechnic, I think, when we went there. Changed its name that many times, I can't remember. And, and we met through the Christian Union uh, and through church, and we were friends for a long time. And then we started going out, and then we started to get to know each other. What do you like? We both like rugby, thankfully. We're both Welsh. Really grateful for that because rugby could get really awkward otherwise, couldn't it? And you get to know you get to know by spending time. What do you think about this? Do you like that? Oh, you don't like fish. I don't like fish. Or whatever it may be. I don't like gardening particularly. My wife does. But you get to know each other by spending time with one another, by talking to one another. You can't get to know God unless you spend time with him. 
and with God we do that through, through reading the Bible, through studying his word, through, through prayer, through worship, through, through collective services like this where we can learn together and then talk about it together and encourage one another. But it doesn't end there just by knowing about God. See, Jesus makes it really clear to remain in his love is also about obedience. In verses 10 and 12 of, of, chapter, of John chapter 13, or 15, sorry, there's this, if you keep my commandments, do you get it? If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love. My commandment is this, my commandment is this, love each other as I have loved you. Jesus commands us, it's not optional, he commands us to love one another. And we thought about that a few weeks ago, didn't we, when we were going through in our John series. This is why Jesus, after saying that we should love God, goes on to say about loving your neighbor as yourself. Love starts with God, but then it moves out to those around us. John the Apostle, writing in 1 John 4.20, says this, If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. The commandment we have from the Lord Jesus is really blunt. Loving God includes loving people. You've got to love both. <coughs> and Jesus is our example here. Jesus is our model, if you like. As Christians, we look to Jesus. He is our role model. He is our guide. Love each other? How? Well, Jesus says, as I have loved you. If we're serious about loving people like Jesus, it will be costly. Because Jesus is the one who called us to, as he puts it in Matthew 5, 44, love your enemies. Love, Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's what he tells us to do. And he's the one who laid down his life for us, out of love for us, while we were still his enemies. That's an example, isn't it? We seem to be living in an increasingly divided world, I think. And we live in a very divided society, and yes, the world itself. We've seen it in this country, haven't we, over the last few years. We've seen how, how the country reacts to things like Brexit. We won't go there, but you know what I mean? There's been a, a real conflict, even between families on these sort of subjects. We see it in other countries, see it in America. Think about the, the presidential elections that have gone on and, and the tension and the fear that exists between different people. Well, as God's people, we're called to commit ourselves to the task of peace in our church, in our community, amongst our, our family and friends and in the world at large. If we want to see peace in our lives and peace in our world, then we need to take seriously Jesus' instruction to love one another. How do we make a, a difference in the world? Well, remember a couple of weeks ago we did the starfish illustration about the lad walking along the beach throwing starfish back into the sea. Remember, I'm not going to go into the details. But when he was questioned about it, he said whether he was making a difference, because there were so many, he would just say, well, I made a difference to that one. I made a difference to that one. Loving one person at a time makes a difference. Makes a difference to that person. And that cascades out. So this morning, 
let's commit ourselves to, yes, to responsible living, but also to faithful service. God has done so much for us in his son. Surely the least we can do is love one another. But let's strive for, for all that is good, for all that, that brings peace, that, that makes real lasting peace. Let's seek as much as we are able at least to heal the wounds of division wherever we find them. Let's work for a just future, not just for ourselves, but for all humanity. God doesn't just love the Welsh, he loves the world. And Christ died for the world, for those who will believe in him. And let's do that by, by following the example of, of, our, of our crucified saviour who calls us to love one another as he has loved us. Regardless of the circumstances we find ourselves in, of the place we may be, whether that be physically or emotionally or spiritually, we can rest assured that we are safe in the arms of Jesus. That's what the hymn writer in the last hymn, when Peace Like a River was talking about, he'd been through the most horrendous time. He'd lost everything in America. He was a rich man, but he lost all his wealth in a fire. And he sends his family to, to England. And he learns that his, most of his family are killed or drowned in a shipwreck. And as he's passing the spot in the next ship, he writes that hymn. He writes about peace, peace knowing God, even though he's going through the most awful personal experience that one can. But we are, we are safe in the arms of our Lord. We're going to sing as we finish.
Let me pray. Father, would you come this morning to remember, to remember the great sacrifice of soldiers who have died to bring us this state of peace which we live in our land. But we thank you this morning that we remember the Lord Jesus and the peace that he brought, eternal peace that we can enjoy with you, the Father, because of his sacrifice. Father, we pray, help us to live the reality of that every day. Help us to be grateful, worshipping people, people who, who love you and love one another um, as we've been commanded. We pray for your blessing upon us this day, for your glory and in Jesus' name. Amen.